Hello everybody, this is Mrs. Clemens once again, and this is Psychology Flipped. And as always, remember, keep calm, study psychology. All right, so this is part two of our four-part presentation on personality, and we're learning about what makes us who we are. All right, so what we talked about last time was the first theory um, or the first school of thought in terms of determining personality, which was traits. And so now we're at our second one, which is behavioral cognitive approach, which is going to study your environment and your situations that you experience and how those lead you to getting the personality that you have. All right, so the first one is the behaviorist. And this is um, the, the guy that's behind this is named Mr. B. F. Skinner. And he said that through operant conditioning, which we're going to be talking about in a couple units in the future, um, that that determines our personality. Basically, when our behavior is reinforced. So I have a friend who hopefully is not going to watch this, but um, and, and she, she has a child. And um, so whenever the child whines, um, she gives her um, candy or she um, lets her watch TV or lets her do whatever she wants, will go and buy her a toy, whatever it is, um, just so that the kid will stop whining. That kid now has learned that whining will earn them um, whatever they want. And so what do you guys think? If you had to think about this, what kind of personality do you think that this child is going to have when they get older? Um, they're learning, they're being conditioned to be whiny and to be annoying to get what they want. And that's, that's how they're probably going to be living their life. And um, so next I have a picture of B.F. Skinner. And um, those of you guys that have had me for U.S. history know that I like to comment on the attractiveness of our people. And he's a hottie toddy. Also, I think his face or head looks like a triangle. Maybe because he has extra brains. I don't know. Uh, our other school of thought that goes under the behavioral cognitive is social learning theory. Now, this is um, headed up by a man named Albert Bandura, and he says that personality is formed by what's called modeling, where basically you observe other people and you sort of copy off of them. So um, I think my brother is a really good example of this, that my brother... Um, well, he watches my parents. And so my parents, when they get really angry, um, they yell and they curse and they scream and they hit things. And well, what does my brother do when he gets angry? Well, he yells and he curses and he hits things. I don't know if he would do that otherwise, if that's in his natural persona. But he kind of learned because my parents behave like that he learned to behave the same way and um and we see that all the time sort of that you want to act like your big brother or your big sister um you're modeling those people are modeling that for you or you have a little brother or little sister that's following you around and is trying to act just like you um so that's social learning theory and here's mr bandura again another hottie toddy all right, so you'll notice when the number comes up here that says four, and that's because I switched things around for our little presentation here. If you want to put a number three, go for it. Um, it does not matter. But um, our next theory is humanism um, or humanistic. And um, our person behind this is Mr. Abraham Maslow, pictured right down here. I think he looks like the guy from Up. Is that wrong? Um, so his focus for our personality is whether or not you achieve your potential and so he has created something which if you can believe it um actually is named after him i can't wait till i create something and name something after me uh the clemens uh, triangle of awesome i don't know i need to work on it but uh so what he has is maslow's hierarchy of needs and the goal is self-actualization and so what he focuses on is 
how you see yourself, your self-concept. So that's, that's what's going to determine your personality. So if you don't think very highly of yourself, then that's, that's going to go in towards your personality. Now, you may notice that Larry, our good friend, the pencil, is here. That's because you're writing down this triangle. Um, how will I know if you're not actually listening to these notes? Because you didn't write down the triangle. Um, are you going to complain about writing down the triangle? Yes, you are. What am I going to tell you? Write down the triangle. Um, so this is Maslow's hierar hierarchy of needs. The reason why I'm telling you to write down the triangle is because it's really important to know each of these. Um, why? Because this actually goes into a bunch of things. If you're going to go into education, they actually talk to us all the time about meeting our students' um, hierarchy of needs. So the, it goes upward. So the first thing that you have to have met is the physiological needs. And that's how you say it. And you can notice that you've got you know, the word physi, like from physical, and then logical like psychological. So um, physiological, you know, that you have food and water and, you know, um, a roof over your head. And though, again, don't tell my mom that I'm saying this. Sex. Okay. Um, that's part of the physiological needs. Oh my God, she heard me. Um, then the next, so once you've met this, so you're eating and you're clothed and, you know, you've got sleep and whatever. Then the next one is safety and security. So you can have someone that, yeah, they're getting enough food, but they're worried every day that they're going to get beaten by their family. So, yeah, you need to move up this next step. So safety and security. Um, it might not mean that anyone likes you, but it means at least you're safe, that you're not worried about somebody coming in in the middle of the night and hurting you. Then after that, you move up to love and belongingness. And this, guys, can be, you know, it doesn't have to be family. It could be, you know, your friends. It can be, um, you know, people at work, people at school. Um, that, yes, yeah, somebody, somebody cares about you. Now, Maslow says that 80 to 90 percent of us never develop beyond this and this is what you really need to think about because so now you know you're loved you know you're safe you know you've got your basic needs but if you don't like yourself then you're not here you're not up to your esteem needs and the esteem needs are dealing with you know that you like yourself that you're not looking in the mirror and you're criticizing yourself that you're not saying to yourself before you take a test oh, I'm gonna fail because I'm such a loser um, that that you feel good about yourself, not cocky, but that you know you you have a fair estimation of yourself. And then the top is self actualization. Um, self actualization. Self actualization is that you have reached your highest potential. So if um, for for me, you know, when I was in kindergarten, I decided I want to be a teacher here I am, you know, maybe I am self-actualized. Um, but maybe not, because when I was in fifth grade, you know, I watched this thing where somebody got teacher of the year, and um, they got to go to Disney World, and I don't know if it was because I wanted to go to Disney World or what, but I said, one day I will be the national teacher of the year. So maybe I'm not self-actualized. Maybe I could be doing something else. Maybe I should be doing something else. I don't know. And think about this. How many of you or, you know, know someone um, that's actually like doing exactly what they're meant to be doing? I, I don't know how many people actually make it there, um, but it's pretty tough. And so you're not writing this slide, but these are some of these are some of Maslow's um, observations. He said he studied um, examples of highly productive people, such as um, oh, it's going away, um, such as Lincoln, Eleanor Roosevelt, Albert Einstein, um, and he found some things that they might have some emotional difficulties, but that they perceive reality accurately that they accept themselves, that they realize, like Lincoln, he knew he was not a, a good-looking dude, but, you know, he didn't, he didn't um, fixate on it. Um, he accepted himself. Being not self-centered, being able to be spontaneous, that they're not just into doing the same thing every day that they always do, that they're able to take risks, that they have a sense of humor, and again, talking about Lincoln, because 
I've, I've read many a book on Lincoln. Um, he was known for having a pretty dirty sense of humor. Um, that you're okay being alone, that you can seek solitude and deal with things on, you know, by yourself. And we're not talking that you're on the internet or texting by yourself or watching a movie by yourself, that you can actually be with yourself and your own thoughts. Um, be independent, have friends, but not be all about like, oh, I have to have like a million Twitter followers or a million um, Facebook friends. And then also be curious and seek new things. All right, guys, next time we're going to be talking about Freud. It's going to be awesome. Stay tuned.